deadly bee is spreading northward toward the United States. A scientific test of their aggressiveness was attempted in Brazil by bee expert Dr. Norman Gary. 500 bees or so have already come out. They're hitting my legs like crazy. I think we're overdoing this one for sure. They're all over my ankles. I'm going to have to move out. One stinging me through the top of the head. Because I wasn't prepared for the kind of action we're getting here. One just got inside my veil. They're absolutely all over me. One's inside, two are inside my veil. One's slinging the ear. Sure wasn't prepared for this one. Honeybees like these have served man willingly. Now that peaceful relationship is threatened by intruders. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The majestic hills that surround Rio de Janeiro usually protect this beautiful city from the jungles beyond. On September 16, 1965, however, a swarm of killer bees attacked in downtown Rio. In their frenzy, they bombarded anything that moved. Sixty people were badly stunned. A fierce new breed of honeybee now threatens the once happy partnership between man and bee. It is a threat, however, that must be met with understanding, not fear. Frightening as it seems, the killer bee deserves our respect. It works harder, lives longer, breeds faster, and produces up to twice as much honey as other bees. To comprehend the behavior of killer bees, we must look first at the European honeybee common in the United States. Dr. Norman Gary is an expert in bee behavior. To him, the complex and usually unseen world within a beehive is a familiar yet ever fascinating place. Ordinary smoke pacifies the bees, allowing a close inspection of the hive. Inside, lies a highly organized insect society. Bees, in fact, are among the most social of all living things. The pure beeswax cones, composed of thousands of geometric cells, form an intricate housing unit. Certain cells store pollen and honey. Others are used as brood chambers to raise new bees. Most of the hive is made up of workers, each with a special job to perform. Some workers do nothing but fan their wings at the hive's entrance. They are the air conditioning unit, fanning tirelessly to ventilate the hive, maintaining an even temperature. Other bees work at keeping the hive clean or in building and repairing the vital combs. No bee is ever without a job. The work of maintaining the hive is continuous. Mortician bees specialize in removing the bodies of dead bees. One way or another, deceased workers are unceremoniously cast away. At the center of every hive is a larger, dominant bee, the queen. Constantly surrounded by a coterie of attendants that does nothing but feed and groom her, the queen is literally mother of the hive. She exudes powerful odors, or pheromones, 
that give the workers a sense of communal security and ensure that no new queens will be bred. Yet her most important role is as the hive's sole egg layer, up to 1,500 eggs each day. For three weeks, the new eggs develop and grow. emerge as fully formed adults. Each new bee chews through the capping of its brood chamber, ready to go to work. A bee's life will last but six weeks. Yet before it joins the active hive, a young bee cleans its own brood chamber to make room for the next generation of young. Soon, the new worker bees begin the task of finding sweet nectar and pollen, on which the entire hive depends for survival. On returning to the hive, workers perform an intricate dance, which communicates to other bees the exact location of a newfound food source. It is not long before a group of workers has found the spot and begun the delicate work of collecting food. In a way not yet fully understood, bees can actually remember the exact location and time of day at which a certain flower produces nectar. On returning to the hive, no worker gains easy admittance. It must first pass the scrutiny of a guard bee, a specialized worker who is constantly on the alert for unwanted visitors. Once inside, nectar is given to another worker. Later, it will be transformed to honey and stored. About once a year, the population of a hive begins to exceed its limits. The workers make preparations to produce a new queen. Meanwhile, at least half the colony gathers around the reigning queen. It is a phenomenon known as swarming. Suddenly, the swarm leaves the hive. They fly away and find a new place to live. The bees common in the United States are derived from the Italian honeybee, which was deliberately introduced here. In Africa, there are also honeybees. In most ways, they are like the bees in North America. Yet in some respects, they are very different. Thousands of years of evolution in a harsh environment has made them a nervous, nomadic race. They breed much faster and swarm more often than other bees. They also work longer, carry more nectar, and produce more honey. Their unpredictable habitat, where sudden brush fires are common and predators in search of sweet honey are numerous, has given these bees a temperamental disposition. They live on constant alert. A sudden movement, a dark color, even the smell of carbon dioxide from the breath of a predator can send them into a stinging frenzy. Their alarm odors will draw every nearby colony to join the attack in a common defense of the hives. In 1956, at the University of San Paulo, this man, Dr. Warwick Kerr, imported 26 hives of pure African bees to Brazil. His purpose was to try to breed the perfect honeybee, a kind of super bee which combined the hard-working, high honey-producing aspects of the African bee with the docile characteristics of the European bee. The African bees were prevented from escaping by queen excluders, metal grills that allow workers to pass through but keep the larger queen inside the hive. 
Bee experts from around the world frequently come to the University of San Paulo. In 1957, a visiting beekeeper mistakenly removed the queen excluders from all of the African hives. The accident occurred at a time when the hives were ready to swarm. With nothing to stop them, the African queens and their colonies easily escaped into the wild. Hundreds of thousands of pure, aggressive African bees swarmed into the countryside. They quickly established wild colonies and continued to breed. Though no one suspected it at the time, the accidental escape of the African bees was the prelude to disaster. Dangerous African bees had been released into an ideal environment. Highly aggressive, they met little competition. Often, they marauded native hives, killing the bees, robbing honey, and taking over their homes. They multiplied at an astonishing rate and established colonies nearly everywhere. In trees, under tile roofs, in the ground, in abandoned cars. Once gentle hives suddenly turned dangerous, the sensitive, easily disturbed killer bees were taking over. Cows and other farm animals were attacked. Thousands had been killed. Vibrations from tractors and other equipment caused savage attacks on many farmers. At the church of Santa Barbara in Niteroy, a wild swarm swooped inside during mass, stinging the congregation. In 1973, firemen used flamethrowers to destroy a wild swarm which had attacked over 300 people at a funeral service. A handful of dirt thrown at them triggered the attack. On several occasions, the commotion of a soccer game has caused bees to launch mass stinging attacks on players and spectators. In 1974, in Recife, Brazil, Jose Ferreira was hospitalized after being horribly stung by a swarm of killer bees. Several days later, he died. In Rio, a wild swarm entered a movie theater, badly stinging the audience. In Curitiba, an autopsy found 80 bees in this farmer's stomach. Three fishermen barely survived another attack. Since 1957, thousands of people have been attacked and badly stung by killer bees. At least 300 people have died. Today, at the University of San Paulo, where the bees were set free, scientists are using genetics to try to solve the problem that genetics created. Using various types of bees, bold and intriguing experiments are being attempted. All are focused on taking the killer instinct out of the killer bee. One technique is artificial insemination. Drones, the stingless bees that fertilize the queen, have been collected from special hives. These drones represent an extremely gentle European variety. One by one, they are carefully removed. Each drone is gently compressed to reveal part of its reproductive system. With a special micro syringe, drone semen is delicately drawn away. Meanwhile, an anesthetized killer queen bee is prepared for artificial insemination. The syringe containing semen from the drone is inched into position. Slowly, the captive queen is inseminated. Her genetic character is thus deliberately altered by science. The queen is then introduced into a hive. If the experiment is successful, the queen's eggs will bear a gentler bee. The hive will become less aggressive. Yet such experiments have had little impact. 90% of all killer bees live and breed in the wild, completely uncontrolled. Another attempt to solve the killer bee problem has been to produce mutant bees by exposure to high radiation. 
A mutant bee, which is physically unable to sting, has been produced recently. It may offer some hope for the future. In the movie Savage Bees, Dr. Norman Gary reenacted an actual killer bee attack. The death of a single bee releases a chemical odor that drives a nearby swarm into a killing frenzy. the escape of this bee near Sao Paulo in 1957, the bees have rapidly migrated throughout most of South America. They're presently going through the Guianas, and they've just been reported in Venezuela. Should they continue their northward migration at 200 miles a year, they could reach the U.S. by 1990. Killer bees could reach the United States much sooner simply by stowing away on a ship bound for our shores. In 1972, at Richmond Harbor near San Francisco, a swarm of bees was found aboard a freighter. Before they spread, they were destroyed. The world's top experts identified them as killer bees. It turned out later they were mistaken. The problem is that killer bees and the honey bees common in the United States are nearly identical. As a result of the Richmond Harbor incident, a sophisticated technique to identify killer bees was invented. Wings and other body parts of suspect bees are carefully dissected. The parts are then projected. 25 specific features are precisely measured and recorded. The information is fed into a computer for analysis and an answer. It is the only way known to distinguish a normal bee from a killer. When the killer arrives here, there may be an additional impact. Every year, honeybees are used to pollinate billions of dollars worth of agricultural crops. The aggressive, hard-to-handle killer bee could make this impossible. The killer bee now predominates in most of South America, and it's spreading fast, quickly liquidating the few docile colonies that remain. This year, Dr. Gary visited the University of San Paulo. One of his objectives was to attempt again a test of the killer bee's aggressiveness. Viewed through an electron microscope, a bee's stinger is clearly a formidable weapon. It is not a single needle, but a three-pronged drill. The main shaft pierces the victim, while two jagged arms alternately stab downward, pumping venom. The venom is contained in a large sac above the sharp sting apparatus. Once inserted, the stinger will keep working until all the venom is pumped in. Wearing a special protective suit, Dr. Gary began the test. All that was required to arouse the bees was to dangle a black leather patch at the hive entrance. Killer bees react violently to black. A second patch on Dr. Gary's chest measures the intensity of the attack. 200 bees around the veil. The patch now is being stung. Uh, there must be uh, 50 bees already have stung this patch on my chest. Uh, I'll continue to get them out. This is the maximum response. So far, I, I have received no stings. I uh, hope this moment there are no openings in my veil. So I 
yeah, there must be uh, three or four hundred uh, stings in my leather patch. I can actually feel them pelting my leather gloves. They are coming out with such, such activity. It's amazing. I actually feel, it, feel the bees hitting me. I made it about the same number of bees around the big camera. There's only one sting at this point that concerns me, and that's the one in my arm. <laughs> I, can, I would estimate that the cameras themselves have at least uh, 100, maybe 200 bees on there. Of course, they can't sting the camera. Even uh, as Dr. Gary left the hive area, the bees persisted in their attack. Killer bees will pursue a victim great distances, stinging all the way. Killer bees don't calm down easily. They remember their anger for as long as 24 hours. Long after the experiment was over, 500 yards away from the hives, even smoke would not stop numerous bees from continuing their attack. Killer bees are unlike any honey bee that we have known. Unless stopped, they will live up to their name. Steadily, millions of killer bees are swarming northward toward the United States. Scientists have suggested various ways to stem the bees' advance. Everything from introducing armies of docile drones that might dilute their aggressiveness to building a giant bee net at the Panama Canal. So far, nothing has been done. When the killer bees will arrive, and exactly how they will behave when they get here, we don't know. For now, there seems to be little we can do but watch and wait.